Great. So I will be talking about, uh, well, it says geodetic Earth observations, but really uh, focused on GNSS uh, networks, the ones run by UNAFCO. Of course, GPS is one component of GNSS. And I want to start by, by focusing on this station. Um, maybe Mike Jack is the, Jack is the only person in the room that knows exactly where this is without the next slide. So P298, this station is sitting next to Parkville, California. Um, of course, it's in this, this great uh, concentration station in California. And if you zoom out a little more, what you see is that, in fact, it's a little hard to see here, um, we have stations in many GNSS networks. All of these run and or process uh, by the gauge facility. They run all the way up here through Alaska, down uh, across the U.S. But the real concentrations are here in the West Coast. We also have out there around the Caribbean, the Coconut Network. The distribution of these stations makes a lot more sense if you overlay the tectonic setting. So here's global tectonics. And what you see is that we have a, a plate boundary going right through this region. And these stations are sitting between the Pacific Plate, the North American Plate, and are observing this tremendous crustal deformation going on. And it goes all the way up, of course, to the lab. So zooming back in, what it looks like at this one station, P298, we're going to set aside the vertical for a second, vertical, and then the horizontal north and east. And we're looking 10 years of data here, about plus or minus six centimeters. This station is moving quickly to the north and somewhat less quickly to the west. And if we put it into its tectonic setting, it makes a lot of sense. So down here, all the nearby stations are also moving that direction. You can see this is right at the boundary. There's an awful lot going on here. There's a tremendous amount of shear. There's this vorticity. This is a tremendous place scientifically. And so looking at this, it makes a lot of sense that if you were to place a network somewhere, you might want to put it here, just because the, uh, the, there's just so much to learn about Earth. At the same time, all of this deformation suggests that well, what might also be going on are earthquakes. And to put this in context, I want to show you, so this is just the uh, Southern California from San Diego up to the Bay Area. And one of the most unique things about this particular part of Earth, this particular desert, is that 2.5% of the global GDP is produced in a 50-kilometer swath along the ocean. So the, the point I was making is you have this economic engine here and in terms of potential disruption, we think about earthquakes, of course, for good reason. So here's the USERF-3 I've overlaying these uh, seismogenic faults. Every number here is the USERF-3 forecast probability of an earthquake magnitude 6.7 or larger over the next 30 years. If you add up all these probabilities, you get a number larger than 99%. So it makes sense to be talking about deformation. And in fact, if you go back to the initial project plan for EarthScope, this is about deformation of a, con uh, of a continent. And the geodetic component was all about this crustal deformation and then the associated hazards. If you go to the actual EarthScope proposal, that was the scientific rationale. Even stepping ahead a few years to the operations and maintenance follow-on proposal, it was the same kind of scientific rationale. It wasn't until we kind of got to CocoNet where you still have this solid earth component, but all of a sudden some other things start to creep in. So here's ocean. This is about sea level. And then we have this big component on the atmosphere. In fact, you could think of coconut as really being a joint atmosphere solid earth project. Cut to Playlock Net, the, the, the solid earth component is the third of three. So what's gone on between the initial science plan for EarthScope and Playlock Net where you get this complete reordering of priorities? And I want to argue that essentially the networks that we put in place, the data sets that were, were available to everybody, started attracting new scientists and new communities. So here in 2009, I know many of us in this room were, I think it was, it was in uh, Utah, there was a, a, a gathering of geodesists to talk about what the grand challenges were looking ahead to the next day. And in those grand challenges, what's the first section? It's about water. You 
Second one is here, the traditional scientific motivation. If you unpack that, so the water part, you get all these new applications. So GPS reflectometry, using GPS to uh, determine snow levels, soil moisture, deformation from surface loading. This is a nuisance parameter. All of a sudden, it shows up as an actual piece of science. There's geodesy and sociology. Down here in this public interest and, and other section, real-time high-rate GPS makes its first really strong appearance. Earthquake early warning. So we've had this great shift in what we think about when we think about the Plate Boundary Observatory or UNAVCO or all these networks that are part of it. So I want to focus in a little bit on this question of where is the water. Uh, in a way, it seems almost trivial because we know where the water is. It's sitting in one of several reservoirs. Um, some of these we know really well. I mean, especially in the, U, the, the West, surface waters are well gauged. Uh, soil moisture is actually bottled quite, quite well. The problem is there are components here that are very poorly observed. Uh, no packing glaciers in particular and groundwater for different reasons. In addition, the sum total, the terrestrial water storage, uh, which is what the hydrologists refer to as the water in all these reservoirs, NASA's GRACE mission is the first time we could actually observe that quantum. And yet, despite the ama this amazing mission, hundreds of papers have come out for it. But the resolution, both spatially and temporally, is not sufficient for what a lot of the water managers want to do with it. So we're getting a lot of good science out of it, but when it gets to the practical aspect, what are we seeing at the watershed and catchment level? This can't quite do it. So we have this scientific rationale for why we want to look at this, understanding the, the water cycle. There's also, of course, the big societal one, and for that, I'm going to put it in the context here. This is moving up from Southern California to Central California. Um, the orient view here is San Francisco in the Bay Area, Central Valley with all the agriculture. And I want to take a look at Lake Oroville. So this is one of a number of very large reservoirs in foothills and then higher up that are built to buffer the seasonal flow of water from the Sierra, the Sierra snow, snowpack. Um, they're also long term storage for buffering between times of plenty and need, like right now. So here's Lake Oroville in 2011. Uh, there's a lot of precipitation across the entire western U.S., and this lake is uh, essentially thankful. Here we are three years later. I can tell you this is not just one lake. They all look like this, and they still look like this. Except for right, maybe this week, Lake Oroville is supposed to come up like 25 feet, but still. So you can see how far back this lake goes. These are massive reservoirs. The amount of water that's lost is tremendous. The system is doing what it's supposed to. It's just been stretched to capacity. So better data better information about the hydrological cycle will actually help manage this critical infrastructure much better. You can imagine if this is important for water, man water resource managers, you knew how much snowpack there was, you knew how much water might be coming in, you might decide not to let any water out you would normally flush out to, to capture the spring runoff. These are important questions. Okay, I want to return to the this, this sort of where is the water science question. from the geophysical standpoint. So how do we get at that? One way to do it is not the gravity. So Grace offers one possibility, which is to look at the gravity of water on the surface. The other one is to look at the geometry. The water loads causing the Earth to perform elastically. You put a load on it, the Earth responds analogous to a rubber block, a rubber ball, it presses, you move the load. And that suggests that we can we have observations. Uh, in this case, it's observable. It's GPS is displacement. We have displacement observations to a surface that allow you to come back and get at that the appropriate uh, physics and math. So here is our same networks. However, this is the hydrological complex. So I've overlain all the major watersheds in the U.S. And you can see that the sampling is not what you would have. It wasn't the way. This is not the way you would have placed the station if your original goal was hydrology. But there's still incredible amount we can do with these data as they are. Okay, so back to our friend P298. We're not going to look at any of the horizontals. They're, they're very interesting. There's a lot you can do with it. Here's just in the vertical. So every station that we have in the network, what we're doing is we're detrending the vertical data set. We have to do that because there's a big tectonic signal in there, and we don't know <coughs> what that is yet. That's, at this point, at least, we can't take the tectonic uh, independently of that. So we detrend. 
and then compose these raw data into, for our purpose here, just a seasonally varying component, and then uh, the residual, and there's a, a smooth, long period, non-seasonal. Think of where these are coming from from the standpoint of this elastic assumption. Now, in the long term, anything where this this uh, time series is below zero, this zero is a long term average. We'll call that long period elastic subsidence due to the addition of water mass. And where it's above zero, the elastic rebound due to the, due to the removal of water mass. All right, so this is feature 98. Imagine taking all of these long term records for every station in continental US. This is what they look like plotted on each other. So this is 1,400 individual time series. Once you have this, you can just imagine taking a time slice out. Each time slice would tell you what all the stations are doing at that moment. So here are two of them, 2011, October. If you look at the color scale here, what we have is, this is water and equivalent thickness layer, thickness, I think that's millimeters. So this is about, actually this is displacement, sorry. So this is GPS displacement plus or minus one centimeter. Um, and what we see in October 2011 is the subsidence across the western U.S. This is corresponding to Lake Oroville bank full. So we're imagining, imagining a lot of extra water. Texas, it turns out, is rebounding. So we're guessing maybe there's some sort of drought going on there. Cut, of course, to October. We're in drought here, and there's this huge uplift. Here. So again, the interpretation, we've lost that water. I wanted to give you a picture of what this looks like sort of in in, in motion, and this is the same color scale, and we're just watching the GPS recording the entire U.S. responding to these loads. What's interesting is that you see waves of activity going across the U.S. There's no seasonal in here. So this whole area just went blue. We're about to see us go into this very wet period right there. Every station is independently calculated, so of course there's some noise in here, but generally, seeing this picture is coherent in space, and it's actually clear in time as well. So here is our drought and expanding, I think it's stopping right there. So we've got these beautiful pictures, but they're not actually what a water manager or a hydrologist needs. You need to convert it to equivalent water load. We're going to take a look at this at the California drought. So here is just one slice of data just for the West Coast, August uh, 2014, not the seasonal, and reference back to the long-term average. We see a lot of uplift, more than one and a half centimeters in certain areas. You convert that to water load, you get something that looks like this. And that's going to zoom out just a little bit. So here is the corresponding water load. It's consistent with all the GPS inflation we just saw. And so the water load is, is equivalent uh, centimeters uh, centimeters of water from scale is minus a uh, full meter, so minus half a meter. First thing to notice is that a lot of the water loss has occurred at all these higher elevations. It didn't put the elevations on there. Here's Wasatch, Sierra Nevada, Coastal Range. Second thing, especially that in the rain shadow behind these, these mountain ranges, you don't get a lot of loss. This is the first thing that is sort of very confidence building because there's not a lot of water in these rain shadow areas to begin with. So in a drought, you lose 50% of a few centimeters versus 50% of almost a meter of water flowing through the mountains. So this makes a lot of sense. The second thing you can do with this is just start doing some, you, you could integrate by catchment, or in this case, just let's integrate across the West. You get very large numbers, 240 gigatons of water and how much water is flowing off of Greenland currently as part of the Greenland Channel. It's a lot of water. Um, as, as an aside, if you are talking to lay audiences, I've learned that none of these metrics sort of resonates at all. You have to use gallons and you have to use a really big number, like trillions, in front of them. Then they'll, they'll rotate it. So looking at this, it suggests a few things. One is this is just a small bit of the U.S. Actually, most much of the hydrology, or most of it in the U.S., is sitting out here. And this, the whole of North America is, in fact, fascinating from that standpoint. If you think about this extended the, the spatial uh, domain, this is not nearly as high resolution as we can get given how many GPS stations. So how about increasing the resolution, 
But what about just going in time? And this is one snapshot. So I'll show you just one of those axes. We've taken the water and same resolution, but we're going to go across the U.S. Same exact uh, techniques that I've just shown. So here's GPS-derived water storage. This is just one slice, uh, December 2011. Uh, so there's that extra water load. That Brim Bankful, Lake Oroville, Texas. At the same time, we saw it looked like there was some sort of uh, uplift. Sure enough, we see uh, it looks like uh, loss of water here, so maybe Texas can go out. That bullseye happens to be Lake Superior at a long term low stand. So not much less water in there, there's been a lot of uplift. I'm pointing out here, so here's the spatial resolution, a couple hundred kilometers, much better in the West, much in the US. Very high temporal resolution, daily sampling, near real time data. Compare that to the only other observation of terrestrial water. So this is the sum total of all water in the system relative to its long term need. Grace gives you the same thing. Not quite as high resolution. What really, what Grace brings to the table is the ability to constrain the long term load chain. So if they're long term hydrological trends, can't get that from GPS because it looks like tectonics can just take it out. So I'm not going to talk about Grace anymore, but imagine now jointly converting these two data sets. That's the direction that, uh, that several of us are going. It's, it's a fantastic way of combining, uh, for, let's say, NSF with NASA. All right, so um, oops. Go back here. So here are just a bunch of time slices that have taken six months. Time slices from 2008 to 2015. There's so much information here. You just have to focus on a couple of places. Imagine, okay, so here's California in June 2011 in Texas. They're sort of in, out of state. A lot of water here, not much here. Opposites going on in just this December. So we're still in a very dry period. Texas looks seeing a lot of water. Anecdotally, this makes you can go in and there's our Lake Oroville, lots of water. At the same time, if you Google Texas drought in 2011, I can almost guarantee you this is the only live cow you'll see. All the rest of them are dead in these pictures. So it was a big traumatic experience for, for Texas, almost as traumatic as the current flooding going on, which is happening at a time of drought in California. We're maybe going right into El Nino, but this is the pattern. You can... Sort of now that we have the whole U.S., you can now carve out individual basins, which I've done this for every watershed. I'm um, showing you California and Texas, and this is GPS and race, race and red. What I'm showing, what I'm trying to show is the amount of flux of water through these watersheds. So it's an equivalent water thickness. How much water is present at any given time? So the water is increasing, decreasing over time. The interesting thing is where California, so we're looking right there. So excess of water, California. This was actually during a La Nina period. In Texas, at the time when there was a deficit. And then when we come out, we move over to the drought that we're in. And the, and the drought starts up. Opposite the things going on in Texas. We have this sense of watershed actually uh, responding in uh, opposite ways. So they're out of phase say that because when we talk about applications, that's one of them. Evaluate the potential of water sharing between regions. It already goes on in California. We move water from the north to the south because there's a lot more water in general in the north. So uh, we, we have that going on. But you can imagine in a time of, of climate change things, a very different climate system, rather than build a desalinization plant, you might want to think about the oil pipeline, the water pipeline, providing water sharing in between regions that are working out of phase. So other types of applications, we're already estimating long-term changes in water availability and there's all these practical needs for it. Drought monitoring, getting close to the early warning part. So when we say drought, if you're thinking about hydrological drought, that gives you uh, this way of sort of know how the whole system is responding, even if we haven't got to quite toward agricultural water impact. For close to monitoring snowpack attachment, I didn't show you this, but we're seeing at the short side, the short period side of GPS, monitoring the flood dynamics as water is flowing through these big catchments. It's, this is just a phenomenal 
way of uh, leveraging GPS in a way that I mean, it looks like noise when you look at that GPS time series. When you pull it out, there's all this stuff. So the point of showing you all of this is just that you can dig into this rich data set in a way that it was never intended, and this is one of many possible ways to do it. And you see all this science going on. It's not just science for its own sake. It's science that actually has real-world So I want to finish just by our, the, the board was talking at today, and we really wanted to start a conversation, which was, so what are the future, future potential of all these the resources that we have, these data sets, this infrastructure, and what is it that the people in the room see? Maybe going forward with our, our new proposal, we start thinking about setting it up not as the initial Earthco proposal, maybe something that's much more forward-looking that encompasses the vision of several uh, agencies, not just the Anyway, thank you. I think uh, I'll turn this back over to Steve. Thank you, Andrew.